Welcome everyone to Who's Who in Aviation Weather, a program where we speak with some of the most influential and prominent people in the aviation and weather industries. This is your host, Dr. Scott Denstead. I'm thrilled to have one of my longtime friends, John Zimmerman, on the program with me. Hey, John, thanks for taking the time to share your expertise and knowledge with us today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. For those who don't know, John is an ATP. He's rated in both fixed wing and helicopters and gliders and seaplanes as well. He's the editor of Airfax Journal and just happens to be the president of Sporties. And he has his own podcast as well. So did I get that about right? That's right. Uh, keeps me busy. All right. So um, what um, got you interested in the aviation flying? What, what gave you the bug for that? Uh, you know, was it come, did it come from your, your childhood? It did. Yeah. I, I, it seems obvious now. It wasn't as obvious when I was a kid, but my dad was a pilot, just a GA pilot, not an airline pilot or anything, but a very passionate one. And so I grew up in the back of small airplanes and uh, just loved it. And uh, so sort of grew up around the airport and uh, learned to fly in high school, you know, sold at 16, private at 17 kind of track and realized pretty early on that I didn't want to be an airline pilot. As much as I loved flying, it was, that was not the career for me. Uh, so sort of grasped around of thinking what I might want to do and ended up working at Sporties in, uh, in the summers between college just because I was looking for a summer job that was at the airport so I could hang around airplanes. So love to tell you there was some grand strategy somewhere <laughs> in there, but there really wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people that you, uh, I've interviewed and talked to over the years have said to me it's they had an interest in aviation from as a kid they didn't like you know wake up in college and said hey i want to fly they always had some interest in going back into it so it's interesting to hear that you uh, started with sporties as a, about how old were you at the time uh i think i started at sporties when i was 19 maybe uh i was going to college and in the summers i was looking for a job to make a couple bucks and wasn't quite sure what i wanted to do I uh, thought, you know, maybe architecture. No, that wasn't it. Too much math. I uh, thought maybe politics. I did one summer interning with a congressman. I knew that wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, was just wanted to hang out at the airport. So kind of did that, honestly, in, in, almost in a lazy way. Of, I like airplanes. Let's work around airplanes. And what I discovered was how incredibly fun and interesting and rewarding the aviation business is. And, and it's so much more than just airline pilot. You know, I, I figured out in high school, I didn't think I wanted to be an airline pilot. And so I had sort of written off aviation as a career path because I naively assumed that was all there was to aviation was be pilot or not be pilot. Uh, and what I found at Sporties was, wow, there's this whole other world of, you know, mechanics and avionics and general aviation pilots and flight training and engineering and just all these other pieces of the industry uh, that people don't talk about enough that fascinated me. So once I got here, I sort of figured I'd do it just for a little while for fun. And, uh, you know, 25 plus years later, I've never left. So it's at this point, they can't even kick you out, right? <laughs> I guess so. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a great mix. I get to fly a lot, but I don't have to fly. So uh, something you know well when talking about weather, you know, you're an airline pilot, you're, you're paid to fly. And sure, you can cancel, but it doesn't happen often. Your job's to, to get them there. And the type of flying I do, uh, fortunately, I, I get to fly as a part of work, but I don't have to, so I can be a little more choosy. Right. So um, out of all the airplanes you've flown, uh, what would you say is your favorite? Oh, boy, that's like, you know, asking a parent to pick their favorite kid. That's mm -hmm. hard. Uh, there's, I, I do believe strongly there's no perfect airplane. Every airplane is trade-offs depending on what you want, you know, short field, long range, haul a lot, go fast, burn no fuel. So there's no perfect airplane. I would say I've had the, the joy to fly a Pilatus PC-12 a fair amount, and that is just such a great airplane because it, it comes close to doing everything. Uh, you know, you can, you can haul a lot of people. I've, I've hauled eight people in that airplane. You can take off out of a short strip. I've taken mm -hmm. off out of, you know, 2,200 foot strips. You can go a long way. I've flown 1,500 nautical miles in it. So it's just a great combination. And it's still for as big, you know, 10,000 pound pressurized turboprop airplane. It's pretty simple to fly. You know, it's, it's a very forgiving airplane. Approach speed with full flaps is 78 knots, you know, close to Cessna speed. Uh, there's no propeller lever. There's just a single 
you know, PCL we call it, but basically throttle. So it's it's a fairly forgiving, easy airplane to fly considering how big and high performance it is. So I, I love that airplane, but lots and lots of other airplanes I like too. I'm not picky. So if the money was unlimited, which airplane would you buy? Oh boy. I'm torn there because it depends again, what's the mission, right? I mean, if, if, if I want to travel the world and, and knock out my bucket list, I'm going to buy a G 700 and, and enjoy every bit of it. Uh, if I would just want to have pure fun, I probably want to buy a P 51 or something and, and go <laughs> blast around, uh, making as much noise and burning as much gas as I can. So I don't know, it'd be, it'd be hard to pick, but, uh, uh, you know, again, for, for realistic, a PC-12 is such a do-it-all. I have such a blast in it. Yeah. So I think uh, I was looking back in some earlier correspondence we had, and I was trying to think when you and I first connected. I know at one point in time I was selling my CDs, my CD-ROMs. Remember those? <laughs> I um, do. And um, that was our our version of trying to get uh, closer to the to, you know, into the uh, you know 2020 range in terms of, of of years. So ultimately, I was putting a lot of my programs, my uh, my workshops on these CD-ROMs and selling them. I bet we probably first corresponded when I was doing that. Um, but we've run across each other a number of times, either at Oshkosh or Sun and Fun or at other AOP A, A events. Yeah, there's there's not too many like you, Scott. So, I mean, I, I knew the first time I talked to you that here's somebody who actually knows the weather part from the meteorology standpoint and the flying part. There's a lot of one or the other. I'm certainly the pilot part. Can't talk much about meteorology. And then there's, you know, meteorologists. You can't talk as much about what it looks like from 6,000 feet in the left seat. So I remember talking to you the first time and thinking, oh, here's somebody who actually understands both sides of that coin. Uh, mm -hmm. And as a as a weather enthusiast more than an expert, I really uh, I really appreciate that and enjoyed learning about what you were doing. And it's been fun to keep up with you through the years. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a joy working with Sporties. And I know at one point back in let's see, two thousand and three, I believe I had um, I did my very first in person workshop. And the folks at Sporties, I don't know if it was through Michael Wolf or somebody else had basically said, um, yeah, you can use our facility, just have everybody fly in. I think I may have had eight to 10 people show up. Um, and you, you guys were so uh, nice to have allow me to use one of your, your rooms. And I think I came back in, I want to say 2015 or 16 or something like that, and did another uh, uh, workshop there uh, at uh, Claremont County Airport. So. Uh, that's my extent of being at Sporties was those two particular times. Um, uh, and also, my, my daughter went to Xavier uh, University, so it was in Cincinnati. Just, just down enough. the road, yeah. Um, so, yeah, speaking about uh, writing and such and, and knowledge, um, I usually, when I read an article, it's inevitable, when, especially when it's weather-related, I can already see, uh, feel the hair on my my arms stand up because I know I'm going to get frustrated with what I'm reading. But I always look at the, the person who wrote the article first. And if that person's name is John Zimmerman. I know I won't, my hair will lay down nicely and I won't have that anxiety. Because <laughs> I do know that, uh, you know, John writes a, a pretty mean article on, on many different occasions. Uh, he's not afraid to speak his mind. Uh, there was a recent... Um, article you wrote that said pilots need to be generalists, not specialists. And I really, um, the, uh, and again, I was, I was hitting that uh, before I even read any words in the, in the article. I first of all went back in my own kind of experience and said, is, is that really true? Just to see what my thoughts were before I even read any of it. And I knew there would be a lot of I interesting stuff in your article. But what hit me was that when I was first starting to learn to fly, you know, people said, well, why do you want to learn to fly? I said, well, I, I need a challenge. And overall, when you look at the overall aspect of flying, it involves you to learn many disciplines. It's not just about stick and rudder skills, but it's also about the ability to look at meteorology, to look at geography, understand how to read maps. There's avionics, there's medical, there's legal, really a lot of disciplines. You never have to be a true master at every one of them to be a good pilot, but you nevertheless, you really have to dig into a lot of details. And so when I, I read through the article, 
I felt, you know, that kind of, at least uh, for me, is what stood out is that you can't really be somebody who is specializing in an area. So talk us through that article and what drove you to write that. I agree 100% with what you're saying there. Um, you know, that to me, that was one of the joys when I learned to fly. It was unexpected. I didn't. I think like most people, you don't really know what you're getting into when you start flight training. And I expected to learn about lift and, and how airplanes fly and stick and rudder. I wildly underestimated how much there was to learn about weather, uh, engines. You know, I, I grew up, uh, I, I played with technology and computers, and I could talk about CPUs and RAM and stuff like that. But... I wasn't great with spark plugs and magnetos. Mm -hmm. uh, and so learning about things like that was an incredible mm -hmm. education. It, it, there's just so much to learn there that to me, the great pilots I've known embrace that instead of seeing that as a, a bug, it's a feature. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's some of what I was trying to convey there. I've, I've spent some time with some new pilots recently who are great pilots, but very much on a fast track towards the airline, um, you know, get those hours, let's chase that career. and in good form it's a great time to go do that but i do think if you're not careful there's something that can be lost by just knocking out the syllabus lessons one by one and knocking out the acs and not thinking about some of the what i call the the extras or the extra credit that is really essential of don't just be able to recite that it's a four-cylinder air-cooled horizontally opposed engine understand what that means mm -hmm. that why does it matter that it's air-cooled not liquid-cooled or weather is a tremendous example of this. Don't just be able to decode a METAR, but understand how that METAR fits into a radar picture, which fits into a surface analysis, which then might influence what the TAF says for later in the day, and then look out the window and correlate that with what your eyes see. I, I just think there's so much opportunity for pilots to really go beyond the basics. And if you're not careful, you can go down this path. Uh, I, I was I was raging a little bit about the the fascination with STEM education right now, which right. I, I'm all about STEM education. The word, the look at math test scores in America. We need to do better teaching right. math. So I'm not against that. Uh, I view that as a necessary but not sufficient part of a great pilot's education. You you really ought to start with the STEM, but go much beyond that. Partly because it'll make you a better pilot, but partly because it's just more fun. I find it much more rewarding if you really unlock all that flying can teach you. And, and to me, flying, the biggest thing it's taught me is how to think. It has, you know, mm -hmm. I occasionally hear people say this about, oh, I took a philosophy class in college and it taught me how to think. And I believe that. I didn't take a philosophy class in college, so I can't evaluate that. To me, flying has taught me how to think. It teaches you how to take in lots of information, how to evaluate it carefully, hopefully uh, dispassionately, how to make tough decisions uh, in the moment and then reflect on that and learn how you did. And I, I don't know that that's a STEM activity. I don't know that that's in the ACS, but I think a, a life spent as a pilot teaches some really wonderful ways of thinking and some great decision-making skills. So that's try, a lot of what I was trying to capture there is encourage people to, to take that next step. Yeah. And I, I, like I, when I read through that, I, I got the, the message that, um, really resonates with me as well. And that is, I really believe that, especially in the aviation world, we see that most pilots tend to have a cursory or surface-based understanding of a lot of things, but they really don't have the depth. And a lot of people say, well, if I drive a car, I don't really know how this, have to have, know how the steering works, you know, how it a linkage and all works. Well, yes, but when things go wrong, it's always nice to have a good understanding of some of these concepts. And, you know, weather is one of those that I see all the time where we see pilots that have that cursory view, just enough information to be dangerous, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a travesty because ultimately the foundation, they don't have a good foundation to walk on in terms of their understanding. And that's why um, you know, I, I, an example of this is um, it was a, a, one of these aviation forums. Uh, there was a conversation. A guy had uh, made a trip and was trying to. Uh, you know, outline his or her uh, suggestions or, or, the, or, or the trip of some icing involved. And so it was kind of get, get a, you know, a, a conversation going about icing. And somebody asked the question, uh, did, was there any uh, G Air Mets, uh, or they said Air Met Zulu for icing that had an SLD in the forecast? And I thought, well, wait a minute, Air Mets don't show you their moderate icing 
they have nothing to do with uh, severe icing or SLD. And so understanding the basic products and what they tell you and what they don't tell you are really quite important. So I'm actually doing a 12-week uh, a weather class coming up starting in January where I'm focused on the foundational information that pilots should, should know about. And yes, I do get in the weeds for some of this stuff because it really it's important to understand that that surface observation or that terminal forecast or that prog chart has some aspects of it that are not obvious from the you know, from looking at it, but are important to understand. Knowing whether or not a particular observation can have a special observation, um, you know, ASOSs have special obs, whereas uh, AWOS will not. Um, so those are the kind of things that are important when you are making those kind of decisions. Like you said, pulling together all that information to make a decision and, and make a good judgment and continue that. I think the, the foundational aspects of aviation sometimes are, are just missing from, from the pilot's uh, cadre of information. You know, once you get your, your uh, certificate, you're free to do whatever you want. You don't actually have to go back and learn anything anymore after that. Yes, you have to do a biennial flight review and such, but that really doesn't involve learning or getting deeper into something. But I, I do agree 100% that you know, flying is not just about that cursory review, but also being curious. And it is, like you said, it is mm -hmm. rewarding to learn more about um, about that particular subject, whether it be in the legal area, medical area, or weather, or even just aeronautics. You know, and here's an example of weather I think that maybe not enough pilots appreciate. It's not just trivia. You need, you talk about going in the weeds on some of this, and and certainly you could you know full well you could spend your whole life studying weather, and there's always more to learn. But there there is a benefit to it. It's not just because I like weather. I think the more you understand. A, the safer it is to fly, but B, the, the easier and more fun it is. So I sometimes see pilots follow this sort of curve where they're learning to fly, they're learning about weather, and they learn just enough weather to cancel. Mm -hmm. And that's good because they stay safe. Okay, I've learned. This, this is not good weather. I'm not going to fly. But there should be a point in your flying career where you kind of get through that dip and you learn enough weather to learn how to go. Not go all the time, not go in the middle of a severe thunderstorm or 10,000 feet of icing, but you should, I like to occasionally sit down and look at the weather map and say, here's my trip. I have to go. How would I do it? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the answer is you can't, obviously. But I think there, there's, there's a point of, if, if you learn more weather, if you really learn all the tools, you can make more flights or at least make more comfortable flights. So sometimes I see pilots sort of say, well, why do I need to learn all this? It doesn't matter. And what I always try to impress on them, it does matter a lot. It matters a lot for safety, but more than just safety. And somehow that maybe that's just sort of a nuanced message that's hard to put, you know, uh, in a single tweet. But I think there's something really important there that if it, as a continuous process, as you get better, it really leads to benefits. You'll fly more, you'll, you'll have more fun, your passengers will be more comfortable. There's a lot you can get from it. Yeah, I always try to say that pilots need to, to work to minimize their exposure to adverse weather. The idea is that as you fly along enough and often enough, you're going to eventually find yourself in some challenging weather. It's not necessarily because you made mistakes. It's because weather is, evolves. It's uh, hard to predict. And there are times where, you know, what you deem as being safe turns out to be, you know, a, has a little bit of risk, extra risk involved. But I do agree that it's sometimes we don't teach the ability for pilots to make a go decision uh, such that, you know, the, the answer is it's never a bad decision to cancel a flight. And I don't disagree with that, but I probably have yep. learned more from flights that I haven't taken because I usually go back and say, what mistakes did I make? Such that, yes, I did, you know, it, was, it turned out that I drove the, the, the three or four or 10 hours or whatever it was to get there uh, instead of the flight, which I, you know, would have been a much less and more enjoyable situation than sitting in traffic. But I noticed, wow, okay, this would have been a flight I could have done. So was it a bad forecast? Was it something I missed? Um, so I always go back and I always say, well, I, I, you, you, it's, it's the kind of situation is, uh, you know, you say, well, it's never a bad decision to stay on the ground. And that's a true statement. But mm -hmm. to say that, you know, uh, there, there, if you make a, a bad decision not to go, meaning you could have went, that's just as bad. And ultimately, you're gonna, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Eventually, you're gonna make a decision to go when you probably should have stayed. 
So you really have to look at the details, especially when it relates to weather, but it's also you know, associated with the aircraft as well, associated with the IFR system that you may be flying in and the airspace you may be flying in. The last thing we want to do is find ourselves in a TFR and get shot down uh, these days. But, so it's a lot of planning that has to be, be done, but you're right, it's, it's a situation where, to me, you know, making that decision to, to go uh, uh, and teaching somebody how to do that successfully and when they eventually do go, uh, understand the fact that the plan, plan um, B and C need to be in place just in the event that things go awry. And teaching that is really a skill that uh, most pilots don't learn in their primary training. I think that's where the role of a mentor is so helpful. And this is hard. This is a hard thing to scale across the entire industry. But I know I've learned so much about all kinds of flying topics, weather may be top of the list by flying with other pilots. And that was one of the things I referenced in that article. There are plenty of days where the answer maybe for you as a low time private pilot is no, don't go. It's not right for you. But a higher time pilot would say, absolutely, let's go. And as much as possible, those are those opportunities to jump at, to fly with someone else. Not somebody random, you know, not, not someone mm -hmm. just off the street who, say, who always says go. Obviously, you gotta have some discretion here. But I think if you have a trusted mentor, uh, it's a great time to learn. Push yourself outside of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. still well within their comfort zone, their experience, their capabilities, the airplane's abilities. But that's really how you learn. Uh, and I just think uh, some of my best weather lessons have been with a more experienced pilot there saying, we actually are going to go, but here's why. Let me walk you through my process. Let me walk you through plan B, C, and D that I have lined up. Let me tell you what my ultimate out is. And uh, that's hard. I think that's an individual pilot thing you have to work on to find who that mentor is, to find those opportunities. But as much as you can, I think that's, that's something that new pilots especially should jump at. Yeah, um, I remember reading an article from uh, Mac McClellan uh, many years ago, and he wrote an article that said uh, he doesn't, you know, he basically says, I just get in the airplane and figure it out in the air. I don't do a lot of stuff. I mean, he said Richard Collins used to do the whole big weather picture stuff because I never did that. And he took this one trip and he freely admitted he got himself into a pickle, got himself mm -hmm. into weather he hadn't expected and wrote an article about it and kind of disclosed the fact that he probably made some mistakes there. And so I wrote a, a blog about this particular article he wrote and explaining all these different things. And somebody, a, com a person um, uh, commented on my blog, probably some old, you know, uh, you know, uh, pilot out there. And I can almost get, you know, s uh, hear his voice, you know, uh, you know, these <laughs> these uh, these academic people you know, referring to me, you know, they're dime a dozen. Uh, you just need to go out and fly more often and you'll figure it out. So what do you expect uh, you so going out and flying more often is that the right answer so i think this gets back to the generalist part i think the answer is yes that's part of it but only when paired with that knowledge of the actual mm -hmm. underlying details you're talking about it, it's so many things in life are presented as either or and the answer is yes the answer is understand and the academic side of it, understand the theory of it, understand not just the weather reports, but what's behind them. And then yes, to get some good practical knowledge, I think it's good to go out and apply that and fly more. Mm -hmm. And for most pilots, not all, but for most GA pilots I talk to, uh, they should fly more, uh, you know, with somebody else, maybe with a flight instructor, maybe with a mentor, but they just flat out should fly more. Because if, if you have, let's say less than 500 hours and you're flying 30, 40 hours a year, the biggest upside for you is just more exposure. Uh, and obviously, you know, do it safely, do it with the flight instructor, all, all the things that, you know, have to be there. But flying more, absolutely, yes, great start. But it's got to be paired with the other part of it. It's got to be paired with the theoretical knowledge. It's got to be paired with some of the book study. So uh, I, I don't see it as an either or. I think great pilots do both. Great pilots have tons of real world <laughs> experience seeing it from the left seat but they're able to actually learn from that experience. It's not just random experience. It's experience that has lessons in it because they have the underlying knowledge that they can apply it. They can say, yeah, look at that. I noticed that we were east of a rapidly developing low and I noticed that there was a temperature inversion here. And so yes, there's ice on the wing, but it's not just some random event that there's ice on the wing. There's ice on the wing because I know what's behind it. And that's really where the deep learning happens. So I think you gotta have both. Yeah, I agree. There's a, there's a aspect of this is uh, is what I call applied knowledge. Basically, the idea is you get the knowledge first, 
-hmm. and then we apply it. And the fact that you go through this same process over and over again, you start to have familiarity. It's a lot like uh, when you get into a rental car. First of all, you don't know where the button is to start it, and you don't know where the little uh, things for the mirrors are adjusted. You really feel out of sorts. But your own vehicle, because you have a familiarity to it, it's all muscle memory. It happens. So ultimately, the same kind of thing happens if you constantly have to go through the process of, of doing that pre-flight planning, looking at the weather, going through that, refining your process, getting that better, getting that more efficient, uh, and understanding that not every weather situation is flyable, but that's that familiarity that happens uh, every single time you get in the cockpit and go someplace. What do you see when you, you do a lot of the training with pilots? What do you think is the the weak link, especially for newer pilots? What are they not learning maybe on a theoretical, theoretical level enough? Yeah, it's, it's usually a combination of things. Normally, it's just not really understanding. If I say, uh, if I ask a pilot, for instance, you know, show me the different pro uh, weather products that you, you're going to get convection, uh, you know, uh, information on convection. They just you know, don't have a clue. They're like, well, I think if you look at the radar, well, yes, yeah, so the radar gives you information, mm -hmm. but it's not really necessarily tells you whether it's going to be convective or not. So a lot of it's not really having a depth to the, 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 the weather knowledge, at least I think, uh, that they need to have at that point and know how to apply that to your pre-flight planning. That would be a fascinating, I don't know if it's a, a blog or what, but there's, I would read something that showed 25 pilots in their unique pre-flight weather briefing flow because this day and age with less and less flight service phone calls, everybody's kind of developed their own flow. Oh, I look at this in floor flight, or oh, I look at this in aviation weather. Uh, it, it's interesting sometimes how much the variation is between the products that people are looking at. Yeah, for sure. All right, so um, what's the best selling product that Sporty sells these days? Uh, right now, it's our flight training courses, our online courses. You know, flight training is so hot right now. There's a there's a pilot hiring boom. There's also just interest in aviation. The backcountry stuff on YouTube has brought new people in. So our uh, online learn to fly course and instrument rating course are just uh, red hot right now. We sell a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of Bose headsets and, and other headsets. We sell a lot of ADSB receivers like Sentry. But uh, at the top of the top of the list right now is those courses. Flight training is really strong right now. As uh, anybody knows, if you've been around a GA airport recently. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I keep myself busy when I'm not doing this kind of stuff or not uh, doing uh, work on my app. I'm always, you know, essentially doing one-on-one -on -one training with pilots uh, via the internet, which is fantastic. That way, they can interact with me, and we do. Pre-flight analysis, we'll, you know, I'm not their briefer, but ultimately we, we look at refining how they're doing their process there. So now, um, if, you, uh, if you had to say now for Christmas, what, what people, with, during Christmas time, what are people buying this time of year? Yeah, it gets a little more gifty this time of year. Um, we, there's a new Garmin watch this year. Garmin's got a new do everything watch. It's, you talk about it, the perfect pilot joke. It's a joke, except it's serious. It's a smart watch that connects to your phone, but also has a flashlight built in. So oh, like wow. every, you know a pilot by their flashlights and their watches, <laughs> that's right? right? So yes. we, that's we've combined sure. two, but that's been, that's uh, the D2 Mach 1 Pro. That's been really popular this Christmas. That may be our, our number one gift this year. Well, good. I, I can still remember I've got uh, my, when I first became a pilot back in the, the late nineties, um, my wife went out and I think went to Sporties and got one of those little glass ornaments uh, yeah. For Christmas. It's still hanging right now on my tree out there, as well as a couple other aviation ornaments that she got through Sporties as well. So that was one of the, I, in fact, you know, she would say, as I was, uh, you know, uh, learning to be a pilot, but also years later, she'd say, well, what do you want for Christmas? Well, here's the Sporties. Yeah, that's where you just casually leave hints around the house, right? That's you right. sort of circle something in the catalog. I will right, we'll end on that note, John. I really appreciate the time and energy. Uh, thanks for showing up on our, my program.